There's a strange passage in the 10th chapter of Mark's gospel that's rarely commented upon. Jesus and his disciples are making their way from Galilee in the north to Jerusalem in the south. Mark says this, And they were going up to Jerusalem, and Jesus went before them. And they were amazed, and as they followed, they were afraid. This obscure fragment is, I think, very telling. One might be intrigued by a religious teacher. One might be captivated by a spiritual leader, but amazed and afraid, his teacher. One might be captivated by a spiritual leader, but amazed and afraid. Then we recall that in the Old Testament, awe and fear are two standard responses to God. And they were in the way going up to Jerusalem, and Jesus went before them, and they were amazed, and as they followed, they were afraid. And he took again the twelve, and began to tell them what things should happen unto him, saying, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man shall be delivered unto the chief priest and unto the scribes, and they shall condemn him to death, and shall deliver him to the Gentiles, and they shall mock him, and shall scourge him, and shall spit it. This obscure fragment is, I think, very telling. One might be intrigued by a religious teacher, one might be captivated by a spiritual leader, but amazed and afraid. And they were amazed, and as they followed, they were afraid. And to tell them what things should happen unto him, and they shall condemn him to death. Then we recall that in the Old Testament, awe and fear are two standard responses to God. What am I making? Reasonable enough questions. He asked, who do people say that I am? It'd be hard to imagine another great religious founder asking such a question. The Buddha wouldn't focus on him and focus on himself. And I say it to his credit. He would say, there's a way I've discovered. I want you to know it. Muhammad wouldn't focus on himself. He'd say, there's a revelation I've received. I want you to know it. Confucius wouldn't say it's about me. He'd say it's about this path that I found. Then there's Jesus. His question is, who do you say that I am? am. His question is, who do you say that I am? The whole gospel really hinges on this point. I never saw so much mud. I counted seven different type muds. You can't imagine how many different kinds of mud. That's what a detective has to be interested in. Jesus' identity personally is what it's about. Because throughout the Gospels, he consistently speaks and acts in the very person of God. The most important thing to know about Jesus is that he's God. Jesus is the God-man. There's been a tendency in recent years to reduce Jesus to the level of a great teacher or a great prophet or guru. Read much of the Christology of the last 30 or 40 years and you'll find that. There's a hyper-stress on the humanity of Jesus. Now, Jesus is human, that's quite right. But the most important thing to know about him is that he's also divine. In the Gospel of Luke, Jesus says, unless you love me more than your very life, more than your mother and father, you're not worthy of me. You might imagine a religious teacher saying, unless you love God more than your very life, but to say, unless you love me more than the highest goods in the world, Jesus compels a choice the way no other religious founder does. Either you're with me, he said, or you're against me. Do you see why? If he is who he says he is, then we have to give our whole life to him. If he is God, then he must be the center of our lives. If he's not who he says he is, he's not a good man. He's a dangerous, misguided fanatic. My name's Alan John Miller, but, but I'm, I'm actually Jesus. I remember all of the events of my crucifixion. I understood what was going on. I understood the reason for my death. And he's collecting disciples. Miller has convinced them that they were with him 
at his crucifixion. He's going to get the spike and smash it into his hands. And just so much love that come from him. So Having grasped this uniqueness of Jesus, we can begin to look at his preaching and action with greater understanding. He was God in the flesh, Yahweh moving among his people. Jesus is strange. You know, I, I, I'm going to resist the tendency to domesticate him and turn him into, yeah, he's like, you know, an ancient uh, Deepak Chopra, you know, who had interesting spiritual insights. And the gospel writers told these kind of cool stories to exemplify that. I think he was strange. And so people say that they were amazed and afraid. I don't think anyone's really amazed and afraid of Deepak Chopra. They might find him insightful and helpful, but I doubt they're amazed and afraid. If, if, we, if we domesticate Jesus too much, we take away that dimension from him. It's what makes Timothy Dolan, I think, arguably, the most effective evangelist in the American church today. Now, here's the thing. Uh, Archbishop Dolan is a very intelligent man. Uh, the study of American Catholic church history being his major area of, um, of interest. And um, his intelligence is, is in everything he says and does. It's very clear. But he knows a great secret. The secret is the most effective way to evangelize is to share the contagious joy of being a friend of Jesus Christ. We recall that in the Old Testament, awe and fear are two standard responses to God. Is to share the contagious joy of being a friend of Jesus Christ. They were intensely interested in the fact that Jesus drove out demons, that he performed miracles, that he healed people. Even like the calming of the storm at sea, you know, when that's over, they say, who, who is this? <laughs> who is this man who can calm the... I mean, they knew all about spiritual gurus. They all had rabbis and teachers and insightful people. But he was so far beyond that. Who, who is this? Well, Bill Maher hates religion. And the movie, Religious, as the title would suggest, it's just this ridiculous holdover from a primitive time. And his strategy in that movie was to take people who, frankly, just weren't that capable of defending their faith to take people who frankly just weren't that capable of defending their faith and bringing before them what he thought were just ridiculous claims from the Bible. So you believe in this talking snake. Huh? You believe that the world is 5,000 years old. Huh? You believe that Jonah spent three days in the belly of the fish. So it just bringing forward all these kind of um, scenes from the Old Testament especially and challenging the uh, literalistic reading. Here's a first response now when I come again, up against this sort of biblical literalism. The Bible is not so much a book as a library. I think once you see that, an awful lot gets cleared up. The Bible is a collection of texts from a wide variety of genre, written at a wide variety of different times, written by different authors for different purposes. You've got in the Bible, sometimes some relatively straightforward history. Think of, you know, 1 and 2 Samuel or something. You've got an apocalypse in the Bible, like the book of Daniel or the book of Revelation. You've got letters in the Bible, like Paul to the Romans or Paul to the Galatians. You've got saga in the Bible, like the beginning of the... Do you take the library literally? Well, it depends on what section you're in, right? You walk in the library, you walk into the history section, okay. You walk into a journalism section, you look at old newspapers. Yeah, you take that more or less straightforwardly. But now you wander into the poetry section. You wander into the mythology section. You wander into the epistolary uh, section. If you approach those texts with the same clunky interpretive lenses that you use to read literalistic texts, you will ipso facto misread them. One of the uh, uh, disciplines we learn in hermeneutics or interpretation theory is how to take off and put on different sets of glasses. But so often my interlocutors say straightforward history or journalism, option A, or nonsense, option B. Come on. <laughs> There's all sorts of options in between those two. And the Bible is full of different genre. We have to be sensitive to that. It's hugely important, I think, as we do our work in when I make this observation, I'm almost always met with the counter-argument. You're just cherry-picking. You're just deciding which texts you want to be literal, which ones you don't. And that gives me the opportunity to say, no, no. 
I'm insisting that we read the Bible within an interpretive tradition. The Gospel of John, we hear, in the beginning was the Word. Complex symbolic readings. That same Word, by the way, that has made the whole universe, the Word I spoke of earlier, that grounds the intelligibility of the world, that's behind all the science of the world, that same Word, who is God, became flesh in Jesus Christ. The poetry section. Jesus says, before Abraham was, I am. Complex symbolic reading. And his I am there echoes the I am who I am of Exodus 3.14. When Moses said to God, what's your name? And he says, I am who I am. Jesus echoes, Complex symbolic reading. I am the bread of life. I am the good shepherd. I am the vine. Complex symbolic Philip says, Lord, show us the Father. And Jesus says, have you been with me this long that you still don't know that the one who sees me sees the Father? Yeah, you take that more or less straightforwardly. But Unless you love me more than your mother and father, more than your very life, you're not worthy of me. Well, that's breathtaking. That's an extraordinary thing to say, isn't it? You might imagine a religious teacher saying, unless you love my teaching more than your mother and father, unless you love God, I can imagine any prophet or guru or teacher saying that, but who could say that coherently except the one who is himself the highest good? I'd like to go on vacation and go and romp and play and just do that. You know what I mean? Awe and fear. Jesus says, unless you love me more than the greatest goods in the world, you're not worthy of me. Who could say that coherently except the one who is himself the highest good? Of, let's go. You can just see the look in their eyes. You know the ones that are doing, you know, and you know the spectators. <laughs> it's like, man, you're either in or you're out. That's Who's this Galilean prophet to say, well, you've heard it said there, but I say claiming authority even over the Torah. Who could do that except the one who is himself the author of the Torah? The, the leader is this man. ...is to share the contagious joy of being a friend of Jesus Christ. When Paul said, Jesus is Lord, he knew just what he was saying. And he knew how strange and radical it was that this Jesus is God. That's the most important thing that we know about the Lord. And I'd push a little bit further. That's why Jesus compels a choice in the way that no other founder does. He doesn't say, I found a truth. Let me tell you about it. I am the truth. Complex, symbolic. I am the life. Complex, symbolic. Those claims are the unique treasure of Christianity. And therefore, as I said, they compel a choice. Either, as Jesus himself said, either you're with me or you're against me. <laughs> it's like, man, you're either in or you're out. That's if Jesus is who he says he is, I must give my whole life to him. He's God. He's the highest good. If he's not who he says he is, he's a bad man. You can find that, by the way, in the apologetic tradition of Catholicism. Out Deus, out malus homo. That means either he's God or he's a bad man. And you got to decide. And John answered him, saying, Master, we saw one casting out devils in thy name, and he followeth not us. And we forbade him, because he followeth not us. But Jesus said, Forbid him not, for there is no man which shall do a miracle in my name that can lightly speak evil of me. For he that is not against us is on our part. Either you gather with me or you scatter. Either you're with me or you're against me. And there is the gospel. The gospel is the good news about this Jesus, and it compels, on the part of those who hear it, a decision, a choice. I think that's the most important thing we know about Jesus. 